Lobsters on leashes, the starving artist, the backroom revolutionary, drunken dandies, these were the bohemians. The idea of middle-class children rebelling against their boomer parents isn't new. We have hipsters, emos, goths, hippies, yuppies, beatniks, and so on. But before all of these, there was another group of the young and restless, the starving artists, the vagrants, vagabonds, and this movement has been around since the very dawn of what many would consider to be the first stable middle class. Let's talk about the Bohemians. No, not those Bohemians, these ones. In the 1830s and 1840s, France was a place of change. After the French Revolution, the bourgeois class was on the rise. This included groups like government workers, merchants, small business owners, and educated or skilled workers. Basically, it was an expansive but not terribly well-defined middle class. This was a time of great upheaval. France was attempting to use new transportation, communication, and economic networks to centralize power, and we see the rise of department stores, trains, telegraphs, boulevards, and capitalism. This new world appealed to many, but the young people of France did not always want to pursue material wealth with no other means, and this rebellion against the material world of their parents leads to the Bohemians. In 1922, André Breton described the Bohemian movement as one to liberate modern consciousness from that terrible fixation mania. Gerald Seigel wrote of the general era that experience shows that having such things, houses, furniture, clothing, social status, seldom succeeds in making us content, but we continue to desire them all the same. So who were these young artists and vagrants who turned their back on the material world of the middle class? Explorers recognized Bohemia by signs, art, youth, the underworld, the gypsy lifestyle. Henry Merger called Bohemia all those who, driven by an unstinting sense of calling, enter into art with no other means of existence than art itself. Seigel once called it the twilight between ingenuity and criminality. The Bohemian movement was a large and fluid group of different rebels with different motivations that changed and adapted throughout the years. The origin of the term comes from the French using La Boheme, to describe the lifestyle of the Romani, also known as gypsies. Although not from Bohemia, this term had been in use since the 1500s and was associated with the informal economy. People who sold house-made objects, scrap materials, or lived outside the law were often said to be like La Boheme, and it grew into a term for vagrants and people on the bounds of society. As starving artists and young people worked to distance themselves from the bourgeois, they were also called Bohemians since they were living a fringe lifestyle. It's important to note that the Bohemians themselves pointed out that there were forerunners to their own movement. The Italian painter Caravaggio and his social estrangement was an early example of this, and in 1792 a writer did say of artists once that their over-lively and over-excited imagination naturally leads to a taste of freedom, independence, even wantonness of mind. Some early eccentric bohemians were bridged over from the Romantic movement and its spirit of rebellion and liberty. This included groups like the Petite Sinanclé, which supported each other in poetic and writing endeavors. They also showed off the charm of the bohemians with men like Gerard de Nerval taking a pet lobster on a leash for walks, or Petrus Borel and his friends camping on a Paris garden in tents while wearing very little and getting chased off by the landlord. Art and eccentricity were the very essence of the Bohemians, even if art didn't always pay well. Henri Mouger provides a template for this sort of lifestyle in the 1800s with his work La Vie de Bohème, or Scenes of Bohemia, first published in 1845 and 1846, which became a play by Mouger and Theodore Barrier in 1849. This play did lead to increasing popularity for the work. It told the story of the writer Rodolfo and his ragtag band of artist friends who are struggling to keep the candles going and the wine flowing. It is very playful in its depictions of the artist, despite showing them in abject poverty and ending in tragedy. It captured the hearts of audiences who were rooting for these eccentric creative spirits to have any modicum of success. It also shows how a central theme of Bohemia was the tension between creating art for the sake of art and wanting to be financially successful. Merger was born to the son of a tailor and concierge, it was barely at the bottom end of the bourgeoisie. Despite this, he wanted to pursue literature instead of practical work. He spent time with groups like the Water Drinkers, who were artists more interested in revolution and freedom from material goods than eccentricity, and he struggled to write for small fringe newspapers, barely scraping by until his later works. Spoilers, the starving artist lifestyle wasn't always glamorous. Mercia wrote about it in one of his smaller articles. The refrain is always the same, poverty, poverty, poverty. 
While the play adaptations of his stories did go on to reach critical and popular acclaim, this never meant financial success, and he died from illness at the age of only 38. Between the stories and his own life, we can see that the struggling artist was certainly a part of Bohemia, but there were other archetypes. Claude Baudelaire was a talented poet and was torn about being part of Bohemia. We can see this dilemma in poems like this one. I am the wound and the knife. I am the blow and the cheek. I am the limbs and the rack, both the victim and the torturer. Instead of embracing dirt, grime, and poverty, he was a dandy, which he defined as people who had no profession other than elegance, no other status but that of cultivating the idea of beauty in their persons. Dandies had been around since at least the 1760s in France, wearing fancy clothes in an exploration of self, or as a middle-class attempt at imitating the aristocracy, or even sometimes aristocrats using clothing as a new barrier to their class, depending on which historian you ask. It often involved fancy clothing and placed a premium on appearance. For some, this meant foppish and extravagant, and for others, they just wanted to look like a self-made man. Some dandies got the best of both worlds. Jules Barbie spent hours in the bathroom refining his clothing, and he also got to experience the crippling poverty of Bohemia due to the cost of keeping up his appearances. He either skipped meals or often ate at poor cafes for students, despite making the rounds and appearing at higher-end establishments. One dandy, Roger de Beauvoir, started off fabulously wealthy, but a disastrous marriage and the resulting lawsuits left him in debt. If his clothing was his art, his methods of avoiding debt collectors were also masterful works. He once had a debt collector climb 10 feet up on a wooden horse to appraise a saddle. Beauvoir then absconded with the latter and fled. One time while being spoken to by a deputy, he flipped the man by doubling his pay and then dressed him up as a Turkish visitor just to make his parties more interesting. Some Bohemians were closer to the criminality part of the line. When Francois Daillet Lefebvre was arrested for smashing a window and brought into court, he claimed that he was an artist and committed the crime because at least then he would get food in jail. He was accused of being a vagrant and at one point replied, What does it matter? Who knows better than I that I am a Bohemian? I am a dramatic artist. I demand to live from my art. But as you know, since February 1848, the arts have fallen into the mud. What have artists become? Beggars. Bohemians. Some artists were more successful, but still associated with these bohemian groups. Painter Gustave Courbet still frequented the bohemian cafes and hangouts, even as he got famous. His works of art, ranging from self-portraits to more famous pieces like The Burial, toyed around with realism to the point where critics called it grotesque or ugly. The Burial in particular was accused of criticizing the Catholic Church and French authority. This experimentation and boundary pushing did help him have a long and successful career. Politically, some Bohemians were involved in the Revolution of 1848 in France, and some even had their hands in the Commune of Paris in 1871. The legacy of the Bohemians lives on in other cultural and counterculture movements. Gerald Seigel draws a line from the works of Merger, Courbet, Baudelaire, and others to the French cabaret scene of the later 1800s, and even into the avant-garde movement of the 1900s. With beatniks, hippies, hipsters, and all the other groups, we can see that today's youth still engages in this spirit of rebellion and the art that fights against the system while never being completely able to distance itself from it. In fact, Seigel argues that the bourgeois and the bohemians were two sides of the same coin, a culture and a counterculture, linked and intertwined and at odds but dependent on each other. Even back then, it was said that you could scratch a bohemian and find a bourgeois. It is true that even with so many artists and true believers, there were some that were basically poverty tourists, who would party hard in the Latin Quarter of Paris, live the lifestyle while they were young, and then return to the shops and businesses of their parents and resume being bourgeois. Genuine starving artists or not, the next time you see a hipster, whatever the new wave of counterculture is, just remember that the Bohemians were doing that before it was cool. Thank you for watching. As always, like and subscribe for more content and stay excited about history. If you guys are interested more in the Bohemian movement, let me know in the comments and I'll make videos detailing more about the art and the literature and things like that. As always, stay excited about history.